Um, do any of you like a challenge? It's, 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 some people just thrive on getting challenged, okay? Um, I mean, I, I, some, I've noticed that there's a lot of teenagers in here. Sometimes if I want them to do something, I don't ask them to do it. I give them a challenge, right? So like if, if, there's, you know, if there's something heavy to be carried, you don't say, would you... Would y'all like to help carry this? Because the answer is no. What you say, especially if it's a guy, I don't know about the girls, but if it's a guy, you say, that's too heavy for you. I'll show you how fast I can carry that. I mean, some of you ladies use that on your husbands. I know that you do, okay? You, you just say, you know, oh, man, you're, you've, you're, that's probably too much. You probably can't do that. Oh, oh, yes, I can, right? And some of us just thrive on a challenge. I know that. In fact, some people just do challenges for fun. I mean, people drink gallon of milk and some of that. Anybody ever done that? I know I have a couple of friends that did. Uh, we have a children's worker named Landon. The other day, I watched him online eat the world's hottest chip. And then I watched him cry for 15 minutes, <laughs> okay? It was pretty great. It's actually still online if you want to find it. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it just, that we, some people just thrive on that kind of stuff. Uh, one time we were at Rosa's with the youth group, and uh, I don't know who started it, but somebody said, I bet you can't eat one of those jalapeno peppers. It was you, okay. I said, uh, I bet you can't eat one of those. And then we had three or four guys all with a big jalapeno pepper. They had that little fresh bar, you know, and they start biting into it. And you know, the first part doesn't have any seeds, right? And you're kind of like, mm, this is good. And after a it, though, a bunch of them were like, where's the milk? Do they have milk? And my, my insides are burning and all this kind of stuff. And it was great. I enjoyed watching it. I don't participate. <laughs> I take on different kinds of challenges, just not the ones that burn. <laughs> okay. And, and here's what I, I want to I present to you a challenge. Okay. And it, it's not a challenge really from me. I believe it is a challenge from Jesus to us. Okay. And I think it is the, the ultimate challenge or like I'm calling it the ultimate pursuit. It is not a challenge that you do one time and you overcome. It is a challenge that we face every day of our life and, and we take it on and we pursue this, this thing. Okay. And, um, and this, this, challenge we started talking about. Actually, I kind of used a different a term or, or a specific term last week if you were here. If you weren't, I'll just kind of catch you up. We, uh, we talked about something called uh, the commander's intent. Okay, so in the military, there's something called the commander's intent. And this, this is what it is. It's a clear and concise statement of what a force must do. Another way you might say that is it succinctly describes what constitutes success for the operation. I got all those big words out this early. We're doing good. Okay, uh, it, it's how we know what they must do. So if there's, an, a, there a, there's a mission they're going on. They'll know, I have to destroy this bunker. We have to rescue these hostages. We have to take this area. There is there's something that is success. If we don't do that, we failed. Okay? And there may be different plans and act ways that we're going to accomplish that, but there is one thing you must do, one thing that is success. Okay? Um, and this is, you, this is true in other things. And um, so when I was in high school, I went to Friday night football, and uh, we were watching my football team lose as usual. And um, we won one game a year, and that was it. But uh, we were watching them lose, and it was fourth down. It was time to punt, <laughs> as usual. And I'll never forget this particular time. So our, you know, the punter gets the ball. He, he, he punts it. It doesn't go very far. And, and so the guy's running up to catch it. And when he comes to get it, uh, he, he muffs it. It goes down on the ground. And now it's a live ball. Okay? And there's the screen. Scramble. And they're not very good. They're kicking it around the field. Nobody can seem to pick the thing up. And there's all this commotion. And finally, one guy from our team swoops in. He grabs the football, okay? And it looked so good. He had that ball tucked just like you're supposed to. You know how you're not like this. You know what you hate? Okay. He had it out. He had it protected. And he ran so fast. He outran everybody else on that field all the way to the end zone. The problem was he got all turned around. There was a punt, and there was a scramble, and all this, and he really did. He ran to the wrong end zone. And it was the strangest thing, watching every coach on the sideline going, no, <laughs> like trying, and he can't hear the crowd yelling. The other team was literally going, do we tackle him? Like, what do we do? We don't even know. Do we just go? Okay. And, and he, and he didn't, I just imagined the conversation on the sideline. Like, what were you doing? I didn't know oh, how you ran the wrong direction. Here's the thing. He ran hard. And he, he protected the ball. He did all of the things. And, and yet, he didn't do what he must do. And that is keep the ball from going into their own end zone and get the ball to the other end zone. That's what you must do. And here is the problem that we face. Many of us as believers in Jesus, 
We are doing the things we're supposed to do. We, we got this, yeah, I'm not, I don't do that bad thing. I do this thing. I'm, in, I'm, I'm going to church. I'm being faithful. And we're running hard. And we're giving it all. But if you miss the main thing, it was a waste. It, we got to know what the main thing is. So you can run and you can go, but we got to get the main thing. And um, so let me tell us, what is our commander's intent? But before I do, let me ask you a couple questions. What is it a believer must do? And what at the end of the day is it that we must do? If you're a believer in Jesus, and, and what is success for a Christian? Like, how do you know you, you're, you're doing it? How do you know you didn't run to the wrong end zone, okay? How do you know that you're not just running without purpose? What is success for a Christian? So one day, Jesus is teaching and things, and a man comes up and asks him a question, and this question will reveal to us what this ultimate pursuit of our life is. And so the question was this, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? This guy comes up to Jesus, hey, what? there's a lot of stuff. What's the greatest? What's that thing that we're supposed to do the most? And Jesus answered. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Now, this was last week's message. If you weren't here last week, it is available online if it's something that interests you. But I just got to say, this is the, the first thing. This is the greatest pursuit of our lives, that we love him. What this means, with everything that we have, with all of our heart, with all of it. But he didn't stop. Okay, I'm not gonna rehash last week. He said, well, he said, this is the first and greatest, and it is the first and greatest. And the reason it is the first and greatest is because you can't do the second one without the first one. Not correctly, this one informs the second one. And so we love it, but then he says, and. And the second is like it. And we didn't stop, and you can't stop either. We can't just say, I love God, and not get the second one, because the second one is critical to fulfilling the first one. They go together, okay? They, they don't work separately. So he says, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I like to say it like this, that this is the primary way that you fulfill the first. There are other aspects to the first, but this is the primary way that you fulfill the first. Now, I can tell you how to get me to hate you. You can't say okay, really, 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 really not like you, okay? I can tell you how. See, I have two kids. You mistreat my kids, I'm not gonna like you. You can buy me gifts, you can give me food, you can, you can sing songs to me, okay, write me songs. I, I don't care if you mistreat my kids, right? Because that's mistreating me. But you bless my kids, now I'm gonna like you. Okay, last week, my, one of my, my son was feeling really, not feeling good, and uh, during this second service, during this service, and uh, Crystal Halbert took my son and held him and sat in a chair and held him for a whole hour, just keeping him quiet and keeping him calm. Now, how do you think I feel about Crystal? <laughs> I love Crystal, okay, I, because she cared for my son, and I watched her take care of him. Now, um, do you all see what I'm dropping here? Every person you see is somebody that Jesus died for. You are encountering God's children. Some of them are very lost children, but they are God's children. And we cannot say, I love God and mistreat his children. They don't go together. So we have to learn to do this thing. And here it says, love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that one of the biggest problems is, is this is such a common phrase that it doesn't mean anything anymore. People that don't believe in God say this. People that, you know, I hear it on, on the news just the other day. You gotta love your neighbor as yourself. You know that one. They don't even know what it's from or love, you know, do to others what they'd have them do to you. And another way we say it, but love your neighbor as yourself. And we say it so much, it doesn't mean anything. Or, you know, it means like, yeah, yeah, I love everybody. I love people over there in Mexico and I love people or down there in Mexico, over there in, in Europe and in Africa. I love everybody, even the Californians. I love them all, okay? I just, I love everybody. And then we go home and we treat our family poorly. And, and I can't stand that guy at my job. And, 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 and we don't love the people in our, that are around us. And we just don't get this. And we think it's simple. We think this is like a, a lesser thing. This is the greatest thing you will have to try to accomplish in your life. It is a challenge to us from Scripture. So um, we need to learn what it is. And Jesus kind of tells us how important it is when he says this, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. He says, everything that you're going to read in here is going to hang on these two things. That if you don't get these two things, you don't get any of the rest of it. In fact, Paul, who wrote a lot of our New Testament, clarified it. He said this, the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. Whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Summed up. Okay, now let me, when I was in high school, 
I love to get the cliff notes for the books that we had to read. Now, most people get the cliff notes, and I'm just not gonna say I'm not guilty of this, but they get them so they don't have to read the book. You know what I'm saying? I just need the cliff notes, okay? Um, but I discovered something along the way. When I had a really, really difficult class that I had a hard time, this is especially in college, when I had a hard time understanding the, the material, if I would read the cliff notes first and then the rest, if I understood the summary if I understood the main thing, the rest was easier for me to grasp. So if I couldn't understand the main thing, the rest was pointless. I wasn't going to understand the you know, biology and all the different things. But if I understood the middle, the, the main thing, I could get the rest. And what we need to, I want you to see, if you don't get this main thing, you will not understand the rest. It won't work. You'll try to do things and you'll do it wrong because you didn't get the summary. You didn't get the main thing. And he just says it right here. What is the main thing? He quotes Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the thing. That's what summarizes the whole thing. And he even says, love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, it is a fulfillment of the law. Love does no harm. So let's make it painfully obvious what this means and how this sum summarizes the law. Um, if I was to say, why should you tell the truth? You could go, oh, oh I know, I know, uh, because lying is a sin. It's a Ten Commandment, you know, and so we should not do that one. And you would be right. Okay, I even learned that one in children's church. We learned songs to learn, to learn these things. Did y'all learn any songs growing up, anybody? If you, grew up in, if you didn't grow up in church, we did weird things. Here's one of the songs I learned, okay? Uh, and maybe you know this one. It went, Revelation, Revelation, 21.8, 21.8. Liars go to hell, liars go to hell. Burn, burn, burn. Okay, I heard somebody else say burn, burn, burn. You went in the same church as me. Okay, it was a little small town. Okay, Alex does not teach that to our children's church. Just so you know, we have banned that one. But, um, okay, should I not lie because it's a sin? Yes. Should I not lie because God said not to? Yes. But let me tell you why you shouldn't lie. Even if it wasn't in Scripture, not to. You shouldn't lie because it hurts somebody. Right. Lying harms the person that you're lying to. And love does no harm. How about this one? Why should you be generous? Oh, oh, I know, I know. Because um, you give God a dollar and he'll give you ten dollars. <laughs> hey, you know why you should be generous? because it helps somebody. I know that's groundbreaking, right? You should be generous because it's loving to people, because it helps somebody that's in need. That's why we should be generous. How about this one? Um, why shouldn't you talk bad about someone? I know. <laughs> the Bible says gossiping is a sin, and you shouldn't do it. Yeah, that's right. Gossiping is a sin. But come on. If the Bible didn't say gossiping was a sin, you can't gossip because it hurts harms someone, and love does not harm. Let's make it real uncomfortable, okay? Youth pastors like to do this stuff, okay? Why shouldn't you have casual sex with someone? <laughs> I know. <laughs> you want to answer? Just kidding. <laughs> the Bible says not to have sex before you're married, and you know, STDs, pregnancy, that whole thing. Like, yeah, yeah, but come on. Here's the thing about this. Sex with someone you're not married to harms four people. The person you're with, see what it robs? It robs intimacy and exclusivity from the person that they're supposed to be married to. And it takes it from the person that they either are married to or eventually get married to. And it hurts the person that, uh, that you're, um, you hurts your spouse if you're married in a dramatic way, or the person that you will be married to if that's something you hope to do. And it hurts yourself. It, take, it, it does damages. Harm, 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 harm. And what did Paul say about love? He said, love does no harm. And so when we look at these things over and over again, if you look at scripture, why is that a command? Because we don't harm our neighbor. And if we don't understand the, this, this main command, this main thing, we don't get the rest of it. And you can actually try to do this stuff and, do, and actually hurt somebody trying to follow the commands. That doesn't make any sense. How can I harm somebody following the commands of Jesus, the commands of the Bible? But if I understand the main thing, I'm not going to harm somebody trying to follow the Bible, trying to follow Scripture. So that's what it is. So um, when I think about this love your neighbor as yourself, there's some major problems that come into my mind. And the first one is that we don't have a good answer to this. What is love? Um, and, and I know that because I hear the way we all use it. We say things like, I love Dr. Pepper. I love Chick-fil-A. I love ice cream. Anybody on that one? Okay. My wife must not be in here. Where did she go? Okay, anyway. Uh, I love the Cowboys, okay? <laughs> I love my kids. I love my wife, okay? Um, okay, obviously, when I say I love Dr. Pepper and I love my wife, that shouldn't be the same thing. 
We use the same word, but that's clearly not the same thing. So I thought, well, let's get some more ideas of what this is. So I Googled, I Googled what is love, okay, just to see what people are saying. And after I got past, baby, don't hurt me no more, okay? If you don't know what that is, you're blessed and highly favored of God because it's been stuck in my mind for two days, okay? Uh, What is love? Um, This is some of the stuff I found. One of them said this, it's really, really liking. That's what's less love. You got, I like it. I like you, I really, really like, okay? In fact, I hear people talking about relationships, they'll be like, well, do you like them or do you like like them, okay? And there's like a difference there if you didn't know. And uh, two likes means more, but then if you really, really like like them, then, then it's love. Okay, that's not love, right? I read this one a couple places. It's, it's committed liking. It's committed liking, okay? It, 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 like I'm committed to liking you, okay? Now, can you see why marriages have problems in our culture today? I mean, you know what I mean, like I like Dr. Pepper, but if it goes flat and is kind of, you know, watered down, I'm gonna toss it out and get another Dr. Pepper, right? And if you treat marriage that way, you're in trouble, okay? It is not committed to liking. It is it's something greater than that. Um, I read this one a lot of places. Uh, love is approving of somebody. And this is actually used against Christians a lot. This is an attempt to tell Christians that you don't love because you don't agree with the lifestyle or belief system of another person, that you have to approve of that. That if, they're, if someone's doing something, you cannot disagree with what they want to do, okay? Now, anyone with any sense recognizes that that's not love. And don't let that be used against you. I walked into my kid's room the other day. I heard this weird noise, so I went in there. And they're three and five, and they have wrapped their arms around each other. They are rolling on the floor trying to hit each other. And they're like, this is, what? <laughs> this is this fight. Now, I, I said, like, I do not approve of that. I love my kids, okay? And that, that, that's maybe dumb, but I'm not going to, you do not have to approve of the, of the lifestyle, behavior, belief system of another person to love them. Okay, so don't buy into that lie. Maybe it's simple. Maybe it's just when a guy sees that girl. You know what I mean? No? Maybe it's more than that. Okay, so what is, what is love? Um, I want us to, to understand this in a deeper way. Because if, if love is the main thing, you should be able to talk about what, know what it is. Okay? And so I'm going to do it two ways. If you're a note taker, and I see a bunch of note takers. Any note takers? That's good. Okay, you're going to like this part. This is for you. You can put your nerd glasses on and write everything down. Okay? I like taking notes like that. Okay? This is good for you. If you don't like that, just kind of, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then in a minute, I'll tell a story that will help us really see love in another way. Okay? So for for us um, note takers, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna even use some Greek, okay? Because we're gonna talk about um, we're gonna talk about four types of love, and the way I want to do that is if you, the New Testament was written in Greek, okay? And Greek is a very descriptive language, and whereas we have four we have one word for love, okay? I love Dr. Pepper. I love my kids, okay? Um, they have many different words for love, and uh, I want to talk about four of those. Three of them are in, in Scripture. One of them is, is described a lot, but not necessarily used exclusively um, in Scripture, but, and, and it helps us. It'll help you, I think, to understand love, okay? So uh, the first one is this, eros, okay? This is a romantic love, eros. This is where the word erotic comes from, okay? Um, eros, it's a passion. It's sex, okay? I don't think I have to describe this. You can see this is a kind of love. This is not when Jesus said, love your neighbor, not that love, just to be clear, okay? It goes on, and he says, storge, okay? And it has like one of those little like, you know, I don't know how to do that in PowerPoint, so storge. Uh, familial love, okay? This is siblings. So this is, the, this is a, an affectionate bond between family members, Okay? And you understand this love. Okay? You have this, this bond. Sometimes this love I've noticed is weird. You can like, just can't stand their face, but someone talks bad about them, and you're like, don't you talk bad about my family. Okay? And there's this, there's, but there's this affectionate bond. There's a connection that you have between siblings or parents and kids. It's a type of love. Then there's phileo, friendship love. Okay? This is um, often used in, like, in with regard to like, brothers in arms. So if you can imagine um, some guys in the military, they're in the they're in the trenches together and they're fighting and they're, and they're you know, surviving together and, and they leave with this camaraderie together. I mean, you may have even had that with some, there's some people you were on a team with, did a thing with back in high school and, you, and still to this day, okay, you have this camaraderie with them when you see them. There's a, it's, a, it's a friendship love. And by the way, this is, is in the scripture a lot that we as a church are to have friendship love, brotherly love for one another. That in a church, this is why you, you can't just like watch church online. You, you gotta be a part because it's a friendship love that you can't have without real connection. Church online is good when you're sick, but it's not when, <laughs> when, you, when you're not. And so it's, a, it's a, something we're meant to have, okay? But still not what Jesus said in that case that we're supposed to have. There was one more that I wanna see, and it's this word, it's agape. It's a selfless, sacrificial, giving kind of love. 
Now, as I was reading some biblical dictionaries, the, the, one of the um, things that they talked about was like, okay, our culture is very obsessed with the first one. But um, and the way that it, one of the ways that it contrasts so dramatically is, is that the first one is about receiving or getting something from somebody else. And this is the way we use love a lot. When you say, I, I love Dr. Pepper, I love this thing, and you, what you mean is I want, okay? You want something from it, okay? But agape does, is not that. Agape is give. It's, it's very contrasting to the other loves. It is not something that I receive from somebody else. It is something that I give sacrificially of myself to other people. And so it's selfless, it's sacrificial. Um, and then so uh, Paul he, he just defined it, okay? And I, I felt like I couldn't hardly do it in a whole series on love and not just at least read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to you because this dis- defines love, okay? It says this, love, and by the way, it's agape here. That's the Greek word. Agape is patient. Love is kind. It, it, it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude, okay? This agape love is not rude. It's not self-seeking. That's the opposite of so much love we see in our culture. It's all about what can I get? No, it's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. People in your life need you to have that kind of love. It keeps no record of wrongs. It's forgiving. It says agape love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in true truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. It never fails. That love, it, it, is, it is not what we usually use the word love for. And I think we've hurt ourselves because we don't, we use it for so many different things. And I'm not telling you you can't say you love your favorite restaurant, but you need to at least know in your brain that is not the same thing as agape love that we have for each other and, and for our neighbor. So um, what is love? It is, it is a sacrificial giving of ourselves to, for others. That is what love is. And so he said, love your neighbor as yourself, which brings me to an, another really important question. Who is my neighbor? Because uh, I, I, I got to know, <laughs> if I'm supposed to love them, who, who is this neighbor? I mean, is it the guy who lives next to me? What is that? Is it the person you're sitting next to? I mean, yeah, probably, but okay, well, who is my neighbor? So this guy comes up to Jesus one time and says this, who is my neighbor? Okay. He wanted to know, okay? After, he, he, after talking about these commands, he says, hey, who is my neighbor? If this is what I'm supposed to do, love people, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus answers in the most peculiar way, by telling a story. Like, why can't he just tell us easy, okay? And he tells a story that you, have, you may have heard, and I, um, I, I would like to, to read it to you. It's called um, the parable or the story of the Good Samaritan. Okay, this is a, you've probably heard, a Good Samaritan. Have you heard in our, they'll, if somebody does anything good, they'll be like, and he was a Good Samaritan you know, on the news, you know? They don't know what it's from, but that's, this is what it's from, okay? Jesus told a story when somebody asked, who is my neighbor? He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. This is not a good situation to be in. He's he's basically dead. He's been stripped of his clothes, and um, there he is. So a priest, this sounds like good news, a priest happened to be going down the same road. Yay, a preacher, here they come, save the day. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He saw him, and he passed. So too, a Levite, these were good people in their culture, when he came to the place and saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, it says he took pity on him, or some translations say had compassion on him, and went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then uh, he put the man on his own donkey and took him and took care, to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you uh, any extra expense that you have. So he went out of his way to help this man and to take care of him. And so then Jesus looks back at this guy who had asked this question, and he's, now he asks him a question. He says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him or compassion on him. And Jesus said, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So the question was, um, who is my neighbor? So I'm gonna give you what I think is the easiest answer and then I'll give you one more to clarify it a little bit. But here's the easy answer, are you ready? The answer is yes. Just look look at anybody in the room, look at somebody. You see somebody? Okay, are they your neighbor? Yes, that's the answer, okay? It is the answer. Anytime you see somebody, the answer is yes. So when you, if you see somebody that annoys you really badly and you wanna know, are they my neighbor? Yes. Is your enemy your neighbor? 
Yes, okay? Any person that you see, the answer is yes, they are my neighbor. Now, of course, you know, this guy asks him, who's your neighbor? And he tells a story. And I wanted to point out who your neighbor is based on what Jesus just said, okay? Your neighbor is this. It's someone in need. Your neighbor is someone in need. And I don't want us to just uh, put this down to only people laying on the side of the road, okay? I mean, I've never, I've never been driving down the road and saw somebody beaten naked laying on the side of the road. Thank goodness, sounds gross, okay? Uh, I've never seen that. And if you wait for something that extreme, you're never gonna live, love your neighbor as yourself, okay? And yes, okay, there are times when we're supposed to help people in need. I have stopped and given gas to somebody who's broken down on the side of the road, okay? I, I, there, there are times that that is, that is part of love. But in maybe in a much greater way, if our neighbor is simply a person in need, Think about what we just read in 1 Corinthians. Love is patient. There are people that are in need of patience in your life, probably in your home, that are in need of patience. They are in need of kindness. They are in need of forgiveness. And love forgives. That is a person in need. Well, I didn't think of that as need. Yeah, that's what they need from you. They don't need you to give them your money. They need you to give them some kindness or to give them patience or to, forg- you know, to forget the thing that they've done. They need somebody to trust them or to protect them or to be there for them. That is the need that they have. And love finds a person in need and helps that need. Amen. Who is my neighbor? Yes. <laughs> It's somebody in need. And I'll tell you what, I, I, if, if you've been around very long, you kind of know this. Everybody has need. We have different needs, but we all have need. And so we need to love our neighbor that way. So the last thing I want to ask about this is, what, what does this actually look like? Like, okay, I mean, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Because that's, that's pretty clarifying a little bit there, because you love yourself pretty good. Okay, like when, you, when, you, when you've gone and you've done something, and, and you did something r- r- no, wrong, wrong, okay? It's hard to say sometimes about yourself, right? You did something wrong. We say, oh, you know, I, I made a mistake. Accidents happen, you know, everybody, everybody messes up, okay? And about ourselves, man, we're forgiving and we're kind and we're patient and we're all that. And he says, this is, this is who you are to others, okay, as yourself. But then, <laughs> in typical <clears throat> Jesus fashion, he takes it to another level, okay? And he says it like this. He says, my command is this, love each other as, and it's gonna give you a different way, as I have loved you. Didn't he not die for people? He goes, oh yeah, I want to make sure you understand. Greater love is no one than this than he laid down his life for his friends. Yeah, he's talking about laying down your life. Now, I, I don't believe he's talking about you need to physically find someone to, to die for. Because then you can only love one time and then you'll be done, okay? I don't think, but there is a laying down of your life. Your energy, your time, you, okay? There is a laying down of your life that we do for the people in our life. And that, that is when we start to see what love looks like. And this can be, um, this can be big. It could be little. Okay. It could be, um, it could be really tiny. So the other day I was playing tennis. Um, I play, um, I go to Warren Park regularly to play tennis. And so I was out there, uh, beating AJ, I mean, playing AJ in tennis. And, uh, and so, uh, we were, we were, we were pitting the ball and I looked over and there's these two kids came and they were trying to play, but they didn't have a real tennis ball. I had this like big pink like hollow ball thing. And they would hit it and the wind would just blow it away. And they hit it and the wind would just blow it away. They couldn't play at all. And they were getting frustrated. And I just kind of looked over and I found the tennis ball and I said, hey, do y'all want a ball? I'm like, yes, please. And I gave them a ball. It cost me 50 cents. Small, little, tiny love. Sometimes it'll cost you a tennis ball. Then there's a couple I know named Randy and Tessa. Tessa has a doctorate in pediatric nursing, okay? She, she, was, um, she worked at a couple children's hospitals in the pediatric ICU, and a credible, credible person. And her husband, Randy, has a, a doctorate in religious studies and, and some other things. And um, so two incredible people. So that, why did they get these degrees? So that they could go to Africa and be missionaries. Now, some people hear that and they go, oh, what a waste, Think of all the money they can make here. I mean, come on, you're working in the, in the ICU of a hospital, you're gonna make them some money, okay? They could be living the American dream. He could be a professor. He could be all these things, you know, well-known. And what are they doing? They're in a, in a small place in Africa, planting churches and giving medical care to people that could never get it on their own. Wow. So, I mean, love could be, here's a tennis ball. Love could be, here's my entire life. I mean, it, it, is, it is so, and it's everything in between, okay? And, and um, 
And so what is it? What does love look like? It's giving. It's giving of yourself. It's giving to people. It's sacrifice. It's going to be sacrificing, you know, being right in this moment. It's going to be costing you things. It costs. It's going to cost you. It may cost you money. It may cost you time. It may cost you energy. It may cost you just, you know, letting them think you're wrong, okay? And whatever it is, it's going to cost you. It's going to be others first. What does it look like? Jesus. It looks like Jesus. That, because that's what he is. If we want to, to love in that way, it's going to be looking like Jesus. So um, I want to just end with this, this helping you um, understand how to learn this love. Because I think it is a pursuit. I think it's something that we do. But I want to have a, a tang- some tangible steps that we take t- to do this. Okay, so here's the first one. And that is, it is simply to ask God to give you compassion. And this is a real prayer that you should pray, okay? And by the way, just thinking, oh yeah, I should have compassion is not praying, okay? Asking God, Lord, give me compassion is that. And um, this is something I, I have grown in as I've gotten older. I look back at my life when I was younger and sometimes I'm saddened by my lack of compassion. And that, so, you know, I was a pretty good church kid. We went to church like five days a week. I, I'm not kidding. <laughs> we were there all the time. And, you know, and, and, and I knew what to do and not to do. I didn't do these bad things. And I, and I kept my life in line and, and all that. And, and so sometimes I would see somebody do something and, and my attitude was not compassion. Like one guy I knew in high school, you know, he, he uh, was out somewhere and he got drunk and the, but the cops came and he ran and he you know, got arrested and he got kicked out of organizations and school and all this. And he had kind of been mean to me, me before. And so I just thought, ha, that's what you get for being stupid. <laughs> you know, running from the police, you left your car there. What do you think they're going to do? <laughs> okay. And, and I was just, and I was like, ha. And you know what didn't happen to my heart? Compassion. I never thought a single, and, and, and I recognized I don't want to be that. Just because he had wronged me, am I going to not have compassion for somebody? And so I've learned to have compassion. But how often do we look at people and go, well, if they would just get a job, if they would just do this, you know, why won't they get this together? Why don't, if they'll just do that and there's just, what, that's not for us. Our job is to be compassion and loving, okay? And, and so we need to ask God for compassion. Some of us need the most compassion for the people that live in our home because they're the hardest sometimes to have compassion for. It's amazing how we can give compassion to a complete stranger and, then, and not to our own family. And I know why, because you see their problems every single day. And that's just all the more reason we need to ask God to give us compassion. And then... What I wish I had an hour to talk about, but I'm only going to spend about two minutes on, is this, that we should ask, what does love require of me? This is a powerful question. It's so powerful, I'm going to make sure you don't, I'm going to try to help you remember it, and I'm going to ask you to say it with me, out loud. Are you ready? What does love require of me? Let's do it again. Ready? What does love require of me? One more time. What does love require of me? So this is how this works. You go home today and there's that family member who did that thing. You already asked them not to do it. Come on. And you're about to speak. What does love require of me? You'll, you'll say something different. You go to work and they're doing that thing and he, he took advantage or whatever and there's a situation going on and before you act and before you speak and before you go into that office, you say, what does love require of me? You will act different. This is a life-changing kind of a question, something that we have to get in. And by the way, this is something our world needs us to do. If Christians would just get this down, that what does love require of me, and they would act based on that, people would look at believers, look at our faith and go, man, I like that. I want, they may say something like this, I don't know if I'm ready to believe in their God, but man, I like being around Christians. I really, you, want, you want your daughter to date a Christian man. You, you, want, you, want, to be, you want to hire a Christian because they, they're different. And why are they different? Because they understand love your neighbor as yourself. Because they live it different. We, it would change the world if we got this. That's how the early church did it, with their love. I mean, I've read books on the power of what happened, that people would look at what they did and how they lived and go, they're different than all of us. And they were so curious. And the early church exploded. What does it take us to love? each other. It would, it, it would change the world, but I think maybe more important for you is it will change your family. If you will start to ask this, and I know, I know, they need to ask it. <laughs> it starts with you. And you start asking this question, um, what does love require of me? It will change your family. And one final thought. When Jesus looked at the world and he asked this question, 
He looked at us and he saw your brokenness. He saw your sin. He saw your mistake. He saw your anxiety. He saw the the broken heart that you have. And he said, what does love require of me? And he came down on a cross and he suffered and he died. And of course he's alive today, but he paid the price. When he said, what does love require of me? He gave everything he have so that you can be free of your sin, so that your anxiety can be given to him, so that those struggles and all of that heartache can be given to him. And he asked this question, he gave it all. And so this is what we are to do. We, because of what he did, we ask this question and we live like him.